What's up, fellas? How's it going? I'm good. How are you, man? Good, good. What, what's your name again? My, hey, my name is Drew. I Drew? am uh, one of the MGAs here. Yes, yes. Gotcha. I did. Um, you probably saw my video Thursday. Oh, you last did the week. video. Yeah, I remember. How's it going? I'm yeah, Chase. Yeah, I apologize. Right. You're good. Chase, nice to meet you. I was on a uh, I was on a flight. I uh, couldn't couldn't actually do it, so I had a recording, and I you know put that on there instead. So yeah, for sure, should work out pretty easy. Should work out just about the same. Yeah. But um, I had to uh, switch offices a little bit because Marvin's doing a presentation, so it's fine. But uh, we'll give it another like five minutes or so. Wait till everyone gets on. Um, were you were you with Geo in his in his uh, voice recordings that he that he put that we're watching right now? Like his POS call and the child safety kit one. And the, yeah, there, was, there, was, there was someone talking about cigars and it sounded like your voice. I don't know. It might have been me. <laughs> might have been. Gotcha. I, I don't know. Maybe. I don't want to say yes. I don't want to say no. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you probably see a lot of the training. Um, I've been with, you know, Tommy for the last five years. Worked in areas with him. Um, and when we came, I got, the, I got the opportunity to come out here, and I definitely jumped on it. Gotcha. Can you guys, first, can you, can you guys hear me good? Mm -hmm. Even if I, like, turn around, you can still hear me good? All right. And, and then can you, can you read those words, or are they backwards? No, they're good. They're good. All right. That's what we're going to be going over today. List the concerns, why it exists, how to break it down, uh, and then the kind of transitions going into um, the the needs analysis for them. So, kind of the one one of the more important parts of the presentation. I'm going to go see if anybody here is actually in person. Grab them. Be right back. Is there usually only, only you three guys on? Mm. Is there more? Uh, usually we have. You yeah, know, it's like Nick, it. Jack, Jared, like some more people, but I have no clue where Ronnie. Ronnie. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I know normally Ronnie, there's at least three more. Yeah, I know Ronnie's in a sit right now with Marvin. Um, that would be the only one I could account for. Okay. I mean, no worries. We'll, uh, we'll get started. Hopefully they, they pop in. Yep. So they just finished, right? They just finished right now. Do you want to just go there or do you want to stay here? I'd rather just stay here with them. Okay. Is there, I mean, you can have Ronnie come in here. All right. Other... All right. All right. So we got one. Okay. Yeah, that's that's cool, Chase. Okay. Yep. Um, that's all I was saying. Like, if you're in a sit, I get it. You know, it happens. Um, this stuff's recorded, and I always get it out to you guys afterwards. But um, like I said, what we're going to go over today, guys, the list of concerns, kind of how to break it down to them. Um, you guys will probably know it better by you know, kind of the uh, the little pie chart, right? Mm -hmm. 
right? Same thing. I'm gonna break it down at like the pie chart though in a minute, um, but I kind of want to just kind of list everything first so you guys understand the, the, the definitions of them and then we're gonna break it down for the member. Um, but before we even go through that, I want you guys to realize like where this list even comes from, right? It's not like we, we pulled this list out of, out of space, right? You gotta remember we're a union-based company. We work with, you know, only unions. And with that, we have what's called the labor advisory board, right? So the labor advisory board is made up of about 50 different union principles. And what they do is they meet every single year and they get together and they discuss what benefit programs that their, their members want to get. They discuss problems within the union. It's a big meeting. Right. They go over a lot of different things there. Now, when we surveyed all those union members, they, they did bring us back a list of about you know, 20 to 30 probably different concerns. But the most popular ones and the ones that are most important were, were the top six that we have here. You can go on. All right. So the Labor Advisory Board, you guys can see on the screen here. These are all the members on the Labor Advisory Board. There's a bunch of them. Some of the more um, familiar ones maybe for you guys, um, a guy named D. Murray Smith. He's head of the NFL Players Association. The NFL is a union. The MLB is a union. The NHL is a union, right? Uh, another couple more famous ones, James Hoffa, right? For, from Chicago, you know, Jimmy Hoffa. Oh yeah, I've heard of him. Right, he, <laughs> Jimmy Hoffa. This is his, his son's son. Right, still Hoffa. He's the president of the International Brotherhood of Teamsters, the IBT. It's one of the biggest unions we represent. Right. So, and I want you guys to realize too that this board here, the Labor Advisory Board, the top people: Steve Greer, Rick Smith, Denise Boyer, right, and Lori. They're all with American Income. Right. They're helping these unions make good decisions about companies like ours, right? And do you guys know how union presidents get in, in force? Do you know how they get there? They're, they're, voted. they're voted in just like the president of the United States, right? So do you think union members are going to vote for someone who's putting bad programs in place? Probably not, right? Because they wouldn't get back in office the next year. So... The, the big thing I want you to take from that is that we're not bringing these, these, these concerns from anywhere. You know, I usually tell my members and kind of start the list of concerns off with, you know, now we surveyed over 30,000 different groups and unions and asked them what they wanted in benefit programs. Right. And they came back with a bunch of different concerns, but we broke that concern uh, that the big list down into about six different areas. All right. Now the six different areas Number one is permanent and portable benefits. That's the most important thing to these union members. Because while they are working, while they have great jobs, while they do get, you know, you know, pretty good pension funds and, and pretty good benefits at work, once they leave the job, they never have those. And I want you guys to realize something about work coverage as well, is that once uh, any person quit fires or repairs, like even if they're not in the union, they typically lose that coverage. Now, especially if they don't even pay for that coverage, if it's given to them through work. If they're given coverage at work, they can get it taken away just as easy because <laughs> they're not even paying for it. And right? so I would never tell anybody to rely on that. So that's why they, they wanted permanent and portable benefits. So our, our benefits are permanent to them as a person, not them as the union member working with the Teamsters. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. got a question yeah uh, for their group term do they have a conversion option with the four thousand dollars or with, no, with, with, the with, with their group term policy through work yeah yeah it's a great question um some companies do some companies don't right now the, the way it kind of works, and I, I'll just break this down for a few guys real quick, but the way work coverage typically works is let's say that this is your job and that every one of these dots is an employee in your, 
right? And then this dot over here is you. So while you're working, they rate this as one healthy individual, right? Now, if you leave work and you, and you get the option to keep it, they rate you individually now. So you might have gotten to that plan, worked there for 10 years, started at 35, you got out, left, left at 45, you're not the same age you were when you started that, right? So yeah, they might get to keep it, but it's not going to be five bucks. It's going to be, you know, 150 bucks to keep the same coverage. And that's, that, that's if they, they let them keep it. Not, not all companies do, because most companies just typically pay for your life insurance. They don't really have any like costs associated with it, you know? And if they do, it'll be like five to six bucks out of their paycheck. They usually don't see it unless they get an option to increase it maximum down the road. Right. Um, I don't want you guys to think that like I'm against work coverage. You know, we, we are like everyone should have work coverage and everyone should max out the, the most work coverage they can get. I'm not telling you like people to cancel their work coverage. Right. I'm just saying, make them realize that it's not a permanent solution. You know, it's a temporary fix for what they have going on. Okay. So permanent benefits, something that's very important to all of our members, making sure that they get to keep whatever they have in force and that it doesn't go up or go down because they left the unit. All right. The second biggest concern is final expenses. Funerals, um, the, the wake afterwards, dinner, getting everybody there together, right? All of that goes into final expenses, not just what's at the funeral home, not just what's at the grave site afterwards. There's a lot that goes into final expenses. And I'll break it down in a minute here for you. Third one would be income protection. This is making sure that their paycheck comes in to the house every single month, regardless of what they're there, what they're there whether they're there or not, All right? So paycheck protection is something that a lot of people understand the concept of and it's why it's easy to pitch the concept of income protection because they get a physical check every month right mortgage protection slash rent protection one of the biggest assets people own is their home right and actually they don't even own it until they pay it off from the bank it's actually the bank owns it right so it's actually their biggest liability so it's making them understand and realize that Yes, you live in a very beautiful house. I'm glad you have that house. But at the end of the day, you don't own it until you pay it off from the bank. All right. Number five is, is child education, debt, or the legacy program. All right. So kids' education is something that's on a lot of parents' minds, whether they're two years old or they're 17 years old. The big reason why is because kids, parents send kids to school to better themselves, you know, to, to get a better job, to, to make more money down the road, to go through the things that they went through. Right? They want a better life for their kids. So a lot of the time you're gonna see people like that child education protection. You know, debt, another big thing. Right? If you guys remember the my video from Thursday, right? All debts are payers, or, or all debts of, of the estate are responsibility of the executor. Right? So if you have any debt in your estate, that's going to go to your executor and they have to pay that off before they get any income. So making sure that that's right. And then legacy, if they don't have either of these, right? Legacy is a good option because they, they're able to, you know, leave money for their family down the road, leave each grandkid $10,000, right? Basically giving them discounted money, selling, selling discounted money. If you want, if you want to go with that, right? And then the last concern a lot of our members want is the ability to qualify and have it be affordable for them. So qualification is a really big thing in life insurance. It's based on two things, your age and your health. Younger you are, the healthier you are, the cheaper it's going to be. Problem with a lot of that is, is a lot of people get out of work. They beat their bodies up over 40 years of working. They have disease, they have diabetes, things like that. It's a good thing our, our, our company, we, when we rate and when we you know, go through underwriting with our members, we ask a lot of these questions, but it's not as stringent as most companies are. And that's just because when we understand that this goes through and this happens to union members, they beat their bodies up, especially in the senior programs. 
in a senior whole life, there's only about nine medical questions, right? And they don't even ask about heart disease. Um, they don't ask about um, diabetes, high blood pressure, cholesterol, all that stuff's not even in there because they just assume. I mean, that's a good thing. And then affordability. That's the needs analysis. Breaking down what they make every month and, and, and taking about 5% of it to recommend a plan for them. All right, so um, I'm going to break down, you know, these main four right here. Final expenses, income, mortgage, and then kids' education, debt, legacy. All right. Apologize if I go off track here, but. Um, that's my brain. All right, so. You guys all um, use the blackboard or the whiteboard, correct? I said blackboard. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Okay, good, good. Okay. So I, I personally don't use it myself, but what I do use is I, um, I have my PowerPoint has basically the same thing, this exact thing here. Has this exact circle and it's broken down into the main areas, you know, final expenses. Income protection. Hopefully my handwriting is not too sloppy for you guys. <laughs> now nah, we can see it. That's why I do it on. Uh, that's why I do it on PowerPoint because my handwriting is not the greatest. Okay, so that's kind of how, you know, you guys would break it down anyway, right? The same, the same four areas, all right? So, you know, the first, how I would get into the concerns, and I would always say the first major concern for a lot of our union members is making sure that the programs that they have are number one, permanent to them and portable so that when they leave work, when they quit, fire, retire, they get to keep it, right? So, just, just to know, let you know, that's why your union set us up with you guys is because all of our programs are permanent to you, not your union, right? Now, the second major concern that a lot of our union members have is, is for final expense protection. Making sure that if God forbid something did happen, that their family didn't have to come out of thing, anything out of pocket to take care of the final expenses. Now, I know that the mindset of this presentation so far, you got a lot of energy, right? You got to be, you got to have a lot of excitement when you're talking to these people. You got to be entertaining, right? This part is a little bit different. You still have to be entertaining, but I want you to be entertaining. You know, I want you to be more engaging than entertaining. Does that make sense? Like you need to ask them a lot of questions here, back and forth. They have to be paying attention and you have to use active listening to get them to engage. Does that make sense, guys? Guys and girls, sorry. Okay. Um, now, the first question I usually ask, you know, the members every time, I'd say, Mary and Joe, you know, have you ever had to, to, to plan a funeral or deal with a funeral nowadays? And they would probably, sometimes they say no, sometimes they say yes. What, it doesn't matter what they say, to be honest with you. Um, I would say, oh, okay, you know, I'm sorry to hear that, right, if, if it was recent, right? But I would say, you know, do you know how much a funeral costs nowadays? Right, that's the end game. That's what I want to figure out. And they'll usually give you a value between, I'd say, $5,000 and $25,000. That's typically what they're going to say every time, right? If they don't know, make them guess. You don't know? Oh, you, you don't know? T just take a, take a guess. Take a guess on how much it costs. Because most of the time, they're going to guess way higher than it costs. They're either going to guess way higher or way lower, right? Both, right? But a lot of people think funerals cost anywhere from ten to twenty-five thousand dollars, which is true, right? Most people have had to deal with the process or have gone through it. I mean, so that's what I say. I say, yeah, you know what? You're you're right, or you're close. Whatever they tell me, I I never I'm never like. If they tell me 25,000, I'm not like, that was a dumb answer. 
why would you say 25,000? You know, I'm like, oh, you're, you're pretty close. You know, actually nowadays it's a little bit closer to about, you know, 10 to 15,000 for a, a funeral nowadays, right? And, you know, cremation, you know, right about the same, probably look, or just about half of that, sorry, anywhere from about five to $10,000. Right. And I kind of list those numbers on the board there or, you know, in my PowerPoint, I have a, a thing that comes across and it says the two. Right. And then I asked them, you know, what do you think funerals cost 20 years ago? Right. I want to I want to see they say this one, because if they say the same thing, you know, I, I got in there because I know that it costs double what it does in years because of inflation. All right, guys, standard inflation is about 3%, 3.2, something wild percent every year. So that means every 20 years, prices are doubled, right? Just like your milk, your eggs, your bread, your gas, right? Gas is a great example of it. Um, I'm old, all you guys are, but I'm 33, right? I remember, I grew up in the 90s. I remember my dad getting gas all the time, right? And he used to have to pay, you know, about a dollar a gallon. Now it's about 350. Out here in Cook County, it's it's a little bit more expensive too. Like I think right next door is like 375, something like that. I thought I said 325. Did it? Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna have to recheck that. Because <laughs> I got gas the other day over there. It was like 375. I was like, Jesus Christ. But either way, it still proves a point. The fact that 20 years ago it was a dollar. Now, three dollars. Right. 20 years from now. Hopefully we're not still using crazy fossil fuels like this. Hopefully we develop something that, that gets us a little bit more efficient, right? But it's still going to be double as expensive, right? And how I kind of illustrate to that, them to that, I'd say, you know, 20 years ago, Mary and Joe, you know, funerals were anywhere from like, you know, five to 10,000 and cremations were only about, you know, three to five, if that. So what that means for you, Mary and Joe, is that 20 years from now, when you're looking to use this, 20 years from now when your life expectancy is, you know, we're probably looking at anywhere from 20 to 30,000 for that same funeral. Now, if they're younger than that, you got to, this is where you kind of got to do a little bit of math and kind of know a little bit of, of things, but just realize that someone that's in their forties, life, life expectancy for a man is about 79, 80 years old. Life expectancy for a woman is about 83, 84. So you just want to kind of get them to life expectancy, get them to about 80 years old. So if they're 20 years old, we got that's 60 years. We got to do this three times. It's going to cost about you know anywhere from 60 to 70 thousand for a funeral at that time. If if inflation keeps going the same way it is, if they're 50, you want to get them to, to 80. That's 30 years, right? Still probably looking at the third house, right? Whatever the value is, so let's just say this example, this guy's 40 years old. So I would say 20 years from now, you're looking at anywhere from 20 to 30,000 for a funeral, right? You're probably not done living yet, right? You got some longevity in your family. So you got 20 more years. Now, at that point, we're looking at anywhere from 40 to 60,000 for that same exact funeral. And this is typically, you know, what the needs analysis is going to recommend for 40 to 60,000, right? If they're in their 40s, right? If they're in their 50s, probably about 20 to 30. You know, if they're in their 60s, probably about 15 to 30, 15 to 20. And right? just be smart when you're showing them this. You know, you don't want to show them 200,000 for their final, unless they want to be like, have a giant parade or something crazy like that, you know? Um, you can even ask them, like, do you want something simple or do you want to kind of go all out? And most people, if they're, if they're comfortable, they'll tell you what they want. You know, I've heard, thing. I've been here five years. <laughs> I've heard, you know, Viking funerals. I've heard uh, um, being cremated and shot up into space. Um, there's all kind of crazy things people want to do, right? Um, but you can be, you can even be like pressed into a diamond or something like that. But 
whatever they want is typically going to be more expensive than a normal funeral. Like just for example, my, my best friend is an ex-wife now, but um, you know, she's still a policy holder. She, um, she life insurance because she wants to be mummified. Yeah. It's kind of, kind of crazy. She's kind of wild. Um, and I, I didn't know how much it cost. So I looked it up right with her whenever I was in the house with her and it's about $40,000 to get mummified. It's a lot of money. I do a lot of things. So got her a policy for 60,000 because 20 years down the road, it's probably gonna be more expensive. Right? So Got to make got to make sure that they understand that now. Yes, probably anywhere from ten to fifteen for a funeral, five to ten for a cremation. Twenty years down the road, twenty to thirty thousand. Right, forty years down the road, forty to sixty thousand. And it's never going to recommend term to cover your final expenses. It's always going to recommend whole life. Always, because that is a when, not an if, right? So once again, to recap final expenses with, you know, you wanna make sure that they understand this is one of the biggest concerns that a lot of union members have, it's protecting their final expenses, making sure that this money is not gonna be a burden to anybody down the road, right? Wanna show them that nowadays, we wanna ask them nowadays, how much you think a funeral costs? Get them to get this amount right here in their head, right? Show them what it looked like 20 years ago. Project out their future, right? Whatever their number is, make sure you write it typically in a different color marker so they can see that, right? And you kind of want to circle it for them. This is getting them to visually represent the words that are coming out of your mouth and visually represent their life. That's why this, this list of concerns is so important because we're getting them right here to, to, to sell themselves on why they need this, right? I, I can sell them all day, but if they don't, if they need it themselves, they're not going to, they're not going to get into it. Right? So what we're doing is we're painting a picture here. We're painting a picture of their life without somebody in it, without Joe being in this or without Mary being in this. That's the, that's the point we're trying to get across with every one of these parts here, right? Now, also, you guys to keep in mind, too, as I'm going through these, not every single person is going to have every single need, right? You might meet a young single person who lives at home with his parents, you know, doesn't have any kids, and, and um, you know, it's just it's the first time he's talking about life insurance, right? At that point, typically not too much income protection. He lives at home with his parents, you know, depending on his paycheck. Mortgage, rent, once again, live with the parents. No one's relying on that. It doesn't have kids or any debt. So at that point, you just got to focus on one big thing here, you know? So not everyone's going to have the same concerns that, that, that this example does, right? But when, when you get done with the final expenses, you always want to make sure that they understand that this is where the whole life is going to be used. You're going to use whole life insurance for your final expenses, right? Because main reason why is because down the road when you're going through this with them and they tell you that they have a lot of term coverage that's great and all but that's not going to be used for your final expenses all right you see how we can use one for one one for the other all right so do you guys have any questions on the final expense protection explaining it to them kind of walking them through how it works anything like that at all nope all right cool cool so I would say Mary, Joe and Mary, the, the next major concern a lot of our union members have was income protection, right? Members were passing away and their families that were relying on Joe's thousand dollars every single month coming in, that was cut off forever, right? So this would be a way to make sure that the next three to five years of, of your income is protected. So that Joe, Mary did not have to change her current lifestyle or take food off the table for the next three to five years. Give her a good buffer. Make sure that that paycheck comes in every single month to pay for the cable, to make sure that the phones all work, to keep the food on the table, the lights on, the bills paid, right? This sure that 
you know, either Mary or Joe, you guys didn't have to worry about where the paychecks were coming in every month. They would automatically come in every single month to take care of it. Right. So I, what I would typically do here with them is break down what they make every month and project it out five years, you know, pretty, pretty kind of simple. Right. So I would say, Joe, you know, for your income protection, what do you, uh, what do you make every month, Joe? And let's just say he says, you know, 3,000. So, no. I usually have a bigger board for this. So I apologize. Uh, let's just say both Joe and make 3,000. Is that too small? No? Okay. No, we can see it. All right, cool. All right, so let's say Joe and Mary both make $3,000 a month. All right, multiplied out by 12. All right, they both make about $36,000 a year. Multiply okay. that by five, it comes out to about 150000 I know it's a little bit more, but just compare numbers, right? So in this situation, if Joe went to work for the next five years, every single day like he's going to and like he has, He's a hundred and fifty thousand dollar asset to this house, right, Joe? Gary, same with you. You went to work, you did the same thing you've done the last ten years for the next ten years, for the next five years. You would bring about, you would bring also a hundred fifty thousand dollar house. You guys are both one hundred fifty thousand dollar assets to this house. Now, Joe, the question you want to ask them here is is a good one. This is when you want to get them to engage. I would say, you know, Mary. If Joe passed away or Joe died tomorrow, would, would that $150,000 be, be kind of a burden to replace? Would, would that be kind of tough to replace? And they would say yes every time. Because that, it's impossible. It's impossible to replace that. What she's going to have to do is go back to school, get a new job, make more money. It takes time. All, all on half of her, half of what she used to, to have it, right? So the big question you want to ask them there is, I would always make sure that you engage with the wife here more than the husband, okay? I don't want this to sound the, the wrong way, but typically we make decisions based on feeling and emotion, and men typically make decisions based on numbers and facts, right? So... And in a lot of these union members' households, it's very traditional to where the man would typically go to work and the woman kind of typically handles the finances and, and, and makes big decisions like this, right? So she has to be on your side more than anybody else in this situation. Does that make sense, guys? I've been in a lot of sits where, you know, the husband's like, oh, you know, I want to think about it. And the wife's like, no, we're doing B. And he's like, okay, I guess we're doing B. Right. Because at the end of the day, she understands what this is going to do for the family. Typically, he's going to look at this as a bill. She's going to look at this as protection and making sure that if he's not here. This all happens. Does that make sense, guys? Like why you kind of want to gear the, the, the conversation toward the wife more than, than the husband. Right. Now, I'm not saying ignore the husband and let him do what the hell he wants to do to him during his sit because he will. Like, if you don't keep him on the chain, he will go do what the hell he wants to do. Right? The wife will typically sit there and pay attention and, and take notes. The husband will be on his phone, not looking around, you know, going to get stuff to drink. Like, he's the one you got to kind of wrangle in most of the time. Right? Um, I'm just doing it. I'm just saying from experience, even being in house with people, you know, um, not even virtual, being in the home, it still happens. Right? But, this is the, the kind of easy math. I'm not talking about doing a lot of hard math, guys. I'm just talking about what they make, multiplying it by 12, and multiplying it by five. And it just visually represents to them what they're bringing into the house. So I would always say, Joe, what it's probably going to recommend for you is about $150,000 of income protection. Mary, same for you, $150,000 of income protection. Now, Typically, the way income protection is recommended to members is typically with a 10-year term. 10-year 
and okay. So, do you guys know what R and C means? Renewable and convertible, right? Yeah. Okay, Chase. Okay, my man. Good stuff. Yes, renewable and convertible. Okay. So our ten-year terms are a little bit different. So. If you, I mean, I hate to even say this, if you like look on the open market, our, our 10 year terms are a little bit more expensive, right? But we have the option for our members that within those 10 years, they're able to convert that into whole life insurance and they get to keep it level, right? That's, that's the convertible part. And then also at the end of those 10 years, they're able to renew the policy without answering medical questions. So that's a big thing because it locks in their health for the rest of the policies blank. They don't have to, most so, companies, when they have, once that term's over, once that 10 years is up, that person has to re-qualify. If their health is uh, paid, once that, on, the, on the downside, then they have to re-qualify and it's more expensive even more, or they might not even be able to qualify, right? Did you have a question, Paul? Yeah. Um, Renew period as well, or is it only renewable in the first ten years? I mean, of, sorry, convertible, convertible. Um, no, it's convertible any of the ten-year terms. So that's a good, that's a good question. That's a good question. So let's say, so your question is this basically: like this person gets it at thirty-five, and it's like I don't know, thirty bucks a month, and that lasts till they're forty-five, right? If they renew yeah. it. And it might go up to like 60 bucks, right? They get to 55. Yeah, they can convert it here or here or here. <laughs> they can convert it all the way up to age 65. Okay. Yep. That's a good question, though. Very good question. So, yeah, they're able to renew it and convert it all the way up to that point. Um, so now the one thing I want you guys to realize here though, is that most people that you're going to sit down with are going to have some type of coverage in one form, shape, or way. It's going to happen. People have life insurance. Don't be scared of that. You just have to basically bend that coverage, if that makes sense to you. So let's say that, and this is where a lot of the time it's going to come into play is the income protection. Let's just say that, you know, going through the needs analysis or going through the um, family information guide, when you ask what they have any life insurance in force, they tell you, you know, that they have covered. You could say, okay, now, Mary and Joe, do you have any permanent, you know, life insurance outside of work? And by at that point, you know that they already have the coverage. So you can just say, now you, you got that coverage through State Farm, right? You know how much it's worth? And they'll probably say like $100,000 or whatever. Let's just say Joe has $100,000 through State Farm. And Mary has $100,000 through State Farm. All right. So you know in your head, they need 150 They only have 100 Still a gap there. Right? But at this point, they're like, yes, I, we have $100,000. We don't need any more, anything else. Okay. <laughs> I, I get that. I get where your head's at. Right? But... Once somebody breaks this hundred thousand dollars to start spending on the funeral, because that's the first thing that has to be dealt with, the rest of that hundred thousand just kind of gets spent, right? It's like, like if if I went to a Seven Eleven or you know a corner store and I needed like milk, eggs, and bread, and that's that that those items cost like fifteen bucks or something like that. I don't know, and. <laughs> And I had a $20 bill and I had a $100 bill. Would I use the $20 bill or would I use the $100 bill? Right, exactly. Yeah. I would use the 20 because once I once I break that $100 bill, I just got a bunch of 20 and then I just spend them. Right? I don't know where they go. Like, I'm sure everyone has done that. I'm sure everyone has been in that situation and it happens every time. Right? That's, how that, that's how this is going to happen too. That's how that's going to get spent really quickly. Joe is, is Joe dies. Mary's going to use thirty thousand to pay for the funeral, right? And then she's going to need another twenty thousand to take care of, 
you know, the expenses for the car, right? And then another 20,000 to pay the mortgage. That's gonna be gone in six months, right? When it should have lasted them five years. So I'm not saying that she's doing anything wrong, but that's just how normally it typically is gonna happen, right? So income protection, from our company, make sure that you know typically they would get like three thousand a month for the next five years, so they wouldn't have to buy a lump sum coming in and then spending it. They can do both though; they can do either or. It's not like they exclusively have to take the three thousand dollars every month. They can take the hundred fifty thousand dollars, right? Only way I would recommend if they ever did that is if they have a financial advisor and they're investing and <coughs> putting it somewhere safe. If they're just keeping it in their bank account, wrong way, wrong way to do that, right? Make that money work for you. For you. If they're not good with money, that comes out of your life, right? Um, but income protection is something kind of, kind of simple about, I mean, all this is really just kind of e easy to talk to them about. The main thing that you have to show them here is your expertise, your knowledge about what's going on in their situation because every family is different right so you're going to have to know just a little bit of math here and do a little bit of quick math but it's not too bad like once you do it a bunch of times you'll know the numbers they'll be stuck in your head you know um but but going through income protection with them typically guys you just want to make sure they understand how important their paycheck is and what their paycheck does every single month. Right? The, the only other big big a way to paint a picture for them and for them to understand income protection if they're really not getting it is is to compare them to an ATM, right? So let's just say, but I'm sorry, I never got your name. Ronnie. Ronnie, Ronnie, okay, Ronnie. So um, Ronnie, let's just say, just roll play with me for a second. Let's say, you know, you're fortunate enough to have an ATM machine in your basement, right? And this ATM machine, you got this. You have ATM machine A, which will give you $4,000 every single month. But if it breaks down, you get nothing. All right, if it ever dies or gets damaged or doesn't work anymore, you get nothing. All right. And then let's say, you know, you have ATM machine B. And ATM machine B is only going to give you $3,500 every month. But it broke down or got damaged. They would send a brand new replacement and it would still spit you out $3,500 every single month. Would you take it? B. You would take B. Even though you're getting $500 less a month, yeah. you would still take B. Ronnie, why would you take B? Because if it breaks down, it gets replaced. Okay. That makes, sense. that makes a lot of sense. You know, makes a lot of sense. That's the right answer, by the way. You're not wrong. That's the right answer. Yeah, could, could you guys hear what you said? Okay. So um, that's 100% the right answer. Now, the reason why is because of you know that if, if something does happen, you're still going to get that 3500 right? Unfortunately, Ronnie, um, you can't just buy an ATM machine and put it in your basement. Uh, doesn't work like that, right? But if you really think about it, you're the ATM machine, right? You're going to go to work every single day to make sure that that $3,500 comes in every single month, right? And the only way it's not going to come in is if you have a breakdown, you get damaged, or God forbid, you need to be replaced, <laughs> right? So... And I'm sure your wife has probably called you, you know, the ATM machine at one time, right? Or the husband's probably called you the ATM machine at one time. Like, hey, you got their hand out. Like, I need my life every month, you know, <laughs> right? So comparing them to an ATM machine, they'll understand income protection. Because they're going to make four grand a month, right? No matter what, as long as they keep going to work. The only way they're not is if they die or if they're in the hurt, something like that. This will replace their income. This will make sure, you know, not all of the 4,000 because some of it's going to be used for the program, right? That's kind of where that comes in at, that warranty. Where the warranty for their life. This is, the, this is their life warranty. If you guys want to put it that way. You know, you know how your TV and your car comes with a warranty? This is a warranty in case you're down. You don't come home from work. All right? So anybody have any questions on income protection? How to explain it to them, the basic math, breaking it down for them, anything like that? <coughs> Why do you uh, do the income per month as opposed to per year? 
like you to start do, off? With? It doesn't matter. You can do both. You can do both. You think they understand it a little better? Like they can estimate their own monthly income better than their own annual income? The reason, the main reason why I do it is because when the needs analysis pops up, it says monthly oh, income, not yearly. Yeah. So you can just put it in. That's. So I already, I, I already know what it is before I have to go into that. Yep. That's the main reason why, but there's no, like, you could do it the way too. Just know what it breaks down monthly. And most people know what they make monthly as opposed to yearly because they their bills monthly, not yearly. You know? Um, any, any other questions, Tony? Anybody? Nope. All right, beautiful. Okay. So income protection, knock it down, All right? They need 150,000 in your term. Now, mortgage protection, the next major concern for a lot of our union members making sure that when they do pass away, if they do pass, I'm sorry, if they do pass away prematurely, that their family gets to keep the house. Okay. Now, this is a very easy one to explain because every day they go home and they live in the house or they live in their apartment. They spend a lot of time there, right? So most people know that their house is important. Not a lot of people do know, though, that they don't own it. The bank does Right, people think they're just paying that mortgage. Right, that mortgage actually says the bank owns the house until they pay it off, the mortgage off. And now, sometimes you guys might run into people who have what's called PMI. PMI stands for private mortgage insurance. Right, that is not mortgage protection. What PMI is is kind of a penalty for putting less than 20% down on the house or having bad credit or um, not being able to qualify for a normal home loan. What PMI is, is it, it basically protects big banks or basically protects small banks from big banks, right? Because if you go, like if, if a normal person went to get a mortgage you know, loan, they go to their local branch bank, right? And their local Chase bank will say, yeah, we'll approve you for this mortgage. It's $150,000, great. Let me go get that money right out of the back. That bank doesn't have that money on hand. But they're not gonna give them just $150,000 in cash either, you know what I mean? But at the end of the day, what that small bank does is they borrow money from a bigger bank. And in order to make sure that a small bank pays the big bank back, they think that member gets to keep in mind. So that'll pay them, that'll, when that member dies, if they die, PMI will pay the big bank back, not the family. The family will still have to pay the mortgage. Right? And the main reason why, like I said, is because if they don't put if they put less than a certain percentage down, or if they have bad credit or things like that, that all negative. But they'll they'll know if they have PMI on their mortgage, it'll be like an extra 60, 50, 60, 70 bucks on top of what they pay, depending on how much they have. Now, once they pay the principal of the mortgage down, though, that's when the PMI typically will just fall off their policy. They won't have to pay for it anymore, right? So I don't want you guys to get confused with PMI because this isn't PMI. This is actually a physical policy that says if Joe dies in the next 20 years, the house is paid off. They'll get the family $200,000 to pay for that house. Now, the way that I break it down for our members here is I would say, Joe, Mary, the next major concern for a lot of our union members is in or is mortgage protection. Let me ask you a question, Mary. Do you guys rent or do you own? You own. Okay. Is it is it all paid off or you guys you know have a mortgage left? Yeah, I've got a mortgage. Okay. What do you guys what do you guys owe left on the house? Let's say they, they owe, you know, let's say that they owe hundred thousand dollars. Let's just keep the numbers, numbers easy. That's what they owe left on the house. And and I would say, Joe, how many how many years you got left? Okay, uh, you know, roughly about twenty. Okay. So I always write that out for them, just to visually represent the, the what's in their head, right? So Joe, Mary, if something happened, you know, <coughs> and go to your home, would you have a tough time paying the mortgage off? That's the one question you want to ask them there every time, Mary. If, if Joe died. And didn't come home from work. You have a tough time paying off that mortgage. 
And of course she's going to say yes. Right? Because they're used to paying $2,000 a month and they're both working. Now she's got to pay $2,000 a month and she's only making three grand a month. Two thirds of what she brings home just for her mortgage. All right? So you want to kind of get them to realize who this is going to affect. Because at the end of the day, the most people want a roof over their head. Mortgage protection would protect Joe for the next 20 years. If Joe died, $100,000 would come into his house to pay off the house. The only thing she'd have to worry about is estate taxes. I know like two, three grand a year. Nothing crazy. Right? I don't know. It's just another one. They're, they're not that expensive compared to paying a mortgage for a whole year. Oh, you said two, three grand. A year, for a whole year. Yeah, my grandmother in Texas pays one. There you go. Better see that's what I'm saying. It depends on the state. Um, but mortgage protection is typically either going to be recommended at, you know, a hundred thousand dollar. Sometimes it'll be a, a level twenty year term. Depends on what how many years they have left. If they have 10 years, it'll probably recommend accidental. But typically what I recommend for them is accidental covers take care of uh, the mortgage, right? Because most of the time, if someone does pass away prematurely because of an accident, right? The number one cause of death in America under the age of 50 is an accident. Over the age of 50, it's heart disease, right? So you're just playing the numbers. Especially if they have a dangerous job, if they drive track, if they drive trucks all day, if they work in, with the firefighters, if you know, there's a lot of people out there with dangerous jobs. Some of those with the SEIU or like security guard, prison guards, things like that. Um, just make them realize, like they know that their job is dangerous. Just make them realize that it's dangerous. That's why accidental coverage is great. So easiest thing to do here, guys, is ask them if they rent or if they own. If they own it. Make sure you get the what they what they pay every single month. Either I, I would I would never get what they pay a month in their mortgage. I would get what their total cost of their mortgage is. Like what do you owe left, right? Because you'll get some people like, oh, we paid two thousand dollars a month for it. I'm like, it's great. I'm not looking for that answer. <laughs> I want how much you pay uh, overall, right? And then ask them how much you know how many years they got left, right? Now on the needs analysis, you'll see that it says like how much they owe, and then the percentage of what their, um, their mortgage rate is, and then how many years. Common, common interest rates on a mortgage are like 3.2, 3.7%. You know, there's a lot of people out there that have it lower. But nowadays, like I, I saw somebody last week who had like a 1.9% on theirs. And I was like, how did that happen? She's like, I don't know. The guy called us and we house. Okay, you got, you got a good deal, right? Um, but most of the time, it's from like 32 to 3.7%, right? That's normal. But if they rent, you can still do the same as rent protection, mortgage protection. You can still do, you can still break it down for them. You know, typically, like it's, it might be a little bit more math involved with it, but it, it's still easy to break down. Like if they pay, even just ask them what they pay to rent a month. You know, if, if, if I sit down with Joe and Mary, I'd say, Mary, what do you guys pay in rent every month? She's thousand bucks, right? Thousand bucks of rent over a year. Twelve grand. You know, I would always project out typically about five years, or you can even do ten years. But honestly, if they're renting a place, they don't want to kind of be there for longer than five years. You know, if they're renting something, they're they're usually saving up money to buy a house or something like that, right? So I don't usually project out that far. I usually project out five to ten years. So I just got out of a sit, and what Marvin had me ask was, do you plan on buying a home? Mm -hmm. Exactly. How much is the home that you're looking at? Yes. Because you're, 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 it's a smart thing because you're projecting your future to them. You're, you're asking them, you know, what, what's important to them. You're finding out why it's important, right? And that's what I'm saying. Like, most people don't plan to stay there more than five years in an apartment, you know? So that's why I, I that's my reasoning behind only really doing five years. So I, make, I mean, hopefully that makes sense. <laughs> so, I mean, that's like what, a 60 grand? Yeah. 
and I would show them that's that's what would that's what would need to be in protect and something happened to Joe so that you could live in that same place in that same apartment and rent free for the next five years. It's five years of your rent married, right? And typically they would recommend it with accidental death. Right. But mortgage protection is pretty easy. Nothing like this is probably one of the easiest things to talk about. I'm going to go over, right? Just because most people know if they own a house or if they rent. <laughs> and most people know that how much it costs. Right? It's one of their, and the reason why is too is because it's one of their biggest bills every month. That's why they know how much it is. It comes out every month. It's one of their biggest bills. Right. Um, it's my biggest bill. It's everyone's biggest bill. Right. Um, any questions on mortgage protection, rent protection at all, how to kind of break it down for them or what to recommend for them? This, this is kind of like a, a very specific question. And I don't know if it's yeah. allowed, but like if they have PMI, is there any way where they can get like insurance protection for their mortgage through us? And they, and they like declare it as it being for the mortgage and that actually removing the need for them to be charged PMI on their mortgage? Uh, typically no, because the PMI is on, protects the banks, not the person. Yeah. But like, but like theoretically though, if they have, if they have a policy protecting their mortgage, then the mortgage is going to be totally paid off. So the bank wouldn't be losing any money. Yeah. in in, in you're not wrong in that thought, but the policy would just be like an accidental policy or a, a 10 year term policy. It wouldn't say like mortgage protection on top of it. Right. Mm -hmm. So there's no way that they yeah, could really yeah, prove yeah. it was for them. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. um, now, the reason why we, we say final expense protection, income protection, mortgage protection, instead of whole life, 10 year term accidental is because it's easier to understand a concept than full numbers. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? We're, we're showing them concepts, but the concept of final expense protection or the concept of, of having your paycheck protected, not $150 for the next 10 years. It's just easier. You know what I mean? And more people get it this way because to be honest, guys, we're not dealing with millionaires and people that make a lot of money and have money for investments. We're not dealing with those type of people. We're really dealing with hardworking blue collar people like myself, my family, your family, you know, that, that don't really have a knowledge behind this. And, and they, they kind of want an easier way to look into it. It's why we exist as a company because we explain this stuff now. Not most companies do. They're just showing numbers, right? And the other reason behind it is because people will buy something that they like, but they'll keep something that they understand, right? So if they understand the income protection protects his paycheck, they're going to keep it. Right. If they understand that the final expense protection protects the funeral, they're going to keep it. Does that make sense? Why it's like concept based, not num not numbers based. Sure. Right. Okay. I mean, that's a good question. Good question, Jace. Um, anybody else got any questions on mortgage protection at all? All right. All right. All right. Now the um, you know the fifth concern, or you know one one of the other big big concerns for our, our unions and our members is childhood, ed protecting the child's education, not any kind of debt, right? Now, if they don't have kids <laughs> or their kids are grown and out of the house, child education protection is not gonna be important to them. <laughs> like I want you guys to realize, don't beat a dead horse there. That's, that has nothing to do with them, right? If you know that going into it, if you know that their kids are grown, maybe they have grandkids, you can mention it, you know? But if their kids are grown, um, all right, you're good, you're good Chase. <laughs> all right, um, so yeah, if their, if their kids are grown, you don't have to worry about the kids' education. But most people that we sit down with typically have younger kids. And my one question to them here every single time is, is I would say, go Mary, Mary Joe. Um, I'm sure you guys want your kids to go to school, right? And they, they they have to answer that question, yes. Right? Yep. The, the way I want you guys to realize the way I'm framing these questions as well. I'm answering yes or I'm, I'm asking yes or no questions, but I'm making sure that they answer yes. Right? I'm giving them an easy out to say yes. You don't want to give them an easy way to say no. You want to get a lot of little yeses right here. Those are going to be like tie downs. The more tie downs you have in your presentation, the better it's going to be. Right? So the
college education is, is making sure that if, if Joe goes and doesn't come home to work from work, that this money is going to go to protect those little students. Now, the question I asked, like I said before, is I would say Joe and Mary. Now, I'm sure you want your kids to go to school, right? And then we typically say that. I say, okay, now we always stay at the company here. If you're not here, all right, let them open up a business. Let them go to trade school. Let them go to a, a four-year university out of state. Right? Now, Joe and Mary, do you know how much you know uh, education costs nowadays? And they'll, they'll typically they won't give you a number right there. They'll kind of just say yeah, a lot, man. And I'm gonna say, yeah, you're right. It is a lot. Uh, if you had to guess, you know how much it actually cost? You know, over over four years. He was like, oh, you know, probably roughly like 70,000, 80,000, right? And, and they're not wrong. Like, you can go to a four year university in state and 5,000 a year, you know, $20,000. You can go to an out of state university and spend $20,000 a year, right? I went to school at West Virginia University and I lived in, and I was from Pittsburgh. So it was an out of state university. I left. <clears throat> Keep in mind, I did spend five years there. Um, I left school with about eighty thousand dollars in debt. All right, that's about that's about how much mine cost. About eighty thousand dollars for for a, a university. A lot of money, right? And to be honest, guys, like college is great, you but there you go. Like you can do that nowadays. Like I should, wish I would have gone to community college for the first two years spent three grand a semester or two grand a semester, you know, and then after that transferred to a bigger school. But, you know, I was, you know, the first person in my family to go to college and, and one of my only brothers that went to school. So I like had an opportunity. To do that. Right. But um, I worked my way through school too. Like it was not, it was not fun. I could have had a lot more fun if I had scholarships or things like that. But it was so hard for me to, to do it, but I would never wish that upon anybody. Like, I, it was tough. So I always tell our parents, like, you know, if you're not here, at least give them an opportunity to do that. Make sure that they, they can better themselves education-wise and not have to kill themselves working for it the whole time. Like, I can't think of a better gift to leave your kid than a college education. If you just say that to them, they're going to be like, I agree. You know, I can't, I can't think of a gift to leave your kid when you're not here anymore than, than a way to better themselves than, than, a, than, a, than a college degree, right? Now, you might run into it like, hey, probably not going to go to school. <laughs> or, or like, yeah, I, I'd love them to go to school, but, you know, I'll let them do what they want, right? You know, you can still leave this money for trade school, opening up a business, buying their first car, getting their first apartment, right? This money is not just used for education. You can use it for a lot of things. What this should say is, is bettering your child <laughs> or, or children's future is what it should say. Because that's what you have to project to them right there. You know? Now, if they have one child, I would do this. So it's, gonna, it's probably going to recommend about $100,000 for little Susie. If they got two kids... It's probably going to recommend about $100,000 for little Bryce. And if they have three kids, and then little Troy, we're going to recommend $100,000 for them as well. So in total, it's going to recommend about $300,000 of protection um, so that if, Joe, you don't come home from work tomorrow, that your kids can all go to school and they don't have to worry about uh, anything education-wise. All right. So child education is pretty easy to break down. I'll use the, ma the maximum amount, $100,000, leaving it to them, all right? Now, if they don't have kids, but uh, you know, they, they are, maybe the kids are out of the house, right? Or they're not in the, um, in the market for kids or something like that. You want to kind of go over debt protection, all right? This one's kind of easy too. All you got to do is ask them, you know, if, if Joe, if, 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 well, I always say, I always go to Mary first. I always say, Mary, if Joe died tomorrow, what kind of, um, what kind of debt would you have to pay off? 
or do you guys have any kind of like crazy debt, any, any kind of credit cards or, or, you know, student loans, right? What, what do you own the credit cards, Mary? Actually like 5,000, not too bad, right? And then they just, they, let's say they just bought a new vehicle. You know, they got to a loan for 25,000 on that. Um, let's just say they got, you know, miscellaneous hospital bills of 15,000 over the years, right? Like you do that math, that's $45,000, you know? If something happened, though, Mary has to pay $45,000 to fix all this stuff. Let's just say Joe had $100,000 in a, a life insurance policy, right? Mary's going to be the most about to pay that off real quick. And then she only got sixty-five or no, $55,000 to play around with. At that point, that's all spent and gone, right? So... Once you guys put actual physical numbers down here, when they tell you that they have coverage, spend the coverage in those areas, right? So if this person told me like for debt protection, let's say they didn't have any debt and they only had, in the, just in this unique situation, they had one kid. All right, so one kid and they rent, right? And, and then let's say they have this state farm policy. Joe and Mary had state farm for a hundred thousand dollars, right? I would say, Joe, you know, because you have that state farm policy, I would say, you know, maybe about, you know, 80% of the income protections to take care of, but you still have about 20%. That would be a gap in there, right? You also have your final expenses that need protected, um, you know, your, your rent protection, and then uh, little Susie's education down the road as well. So Joe, I'm going to, I'm going to ask you one question here. Um, it's a very important question and keep in mind, there's no right or wrong answers to it, but Joe, if you die tomorrow and didn't come home, what would you, what, what would you say is one of the most important things that's, you want you wanted to pick one here, right? This question that guys, this question needs to be asked every single time you go over this with them, unless there's only one thing they have to pick from. Does that make sense? So if there's only final expense protection, you don't have to ask them this question. But if there's three, right? I would say, Joe, God forbid if you if you die tomorrow and didn't come home from work, and you can guarantee that either your final expenses, your income, your mortgage or your child's education was protected, which would you say is the most important to you? And I'll just let them answer. And let's just say in this situation, he says mortgage protection. I, I would say, he would say Drew mortgage protection. Okay. And then I would ask him, you said mortgage protection, Joe? Why would you say mortgage protection? You want them, you want to ask them why they're doing it in that situation. Does that make sense, guys? Like you're getting them to sell themselves right here on why that's important to them. He might say, oh, mortgage protection, because that's why Mary, that, that, that Mary and Joe and, and kid can live in the house, you know, and then we'll not have to worry about paying for the house. Okay, I guess that, great answer, great answer, you know. I understand that the house has been in the family name for a good while and you guys want to keep it that way. You know, most of our members actually use this, usually say the same thing. You just want to figure out why it's important to them. You know, if you said income protection, income protection is the most important. I would say, Joe, why is your income the most important thing to you? It's most important because, you know, every single month, you know, I, I know that, jo that Mary would have $3,000 to keep the food on the table, the lights on, the bills paid. Right. Or most of the time when they say income protection, they're going to say, because it, it makes it, it protects my income. That's true what they say, to be honest. They say they give you like a very basic answer. They'll say because it protects my income. And I would say, yeah, it, it would protect your income, Joe. Um, but what, what does your income do for the house every month? That's what you wanted to answer. What is what is this? What is this paycheck directly take care of every month? Right, because we're make, make what we're doing is we're getting the concept sink into something in real life. He would say, uh, whew, it, it pays the phone bills, pays the cable, you know, the water bill, the light bill, it pays out all those. Right? So mortgage protection, Joe. I, I would, 
you know, I would say actually most people in your situation say the same thing. Whatever they tell you here, guys, agree with them. It was a yes. I, I would agree with you, Joe, one hundred percent. The final expenses are, you know, one of the most important areas for you as well. Um, you know, most members actually say the same exact thing that are in your situation. Okay. And then you ask Mary the same question, Mary. If you die tomorrow and you did not come home from work, do you guarantee that your final expenses, your income, your mortgage, or your kids' education is protected? What would you say is the most important to you? And let her answer. And whenever she says, circle it again. So Mary, you said your final expenses. Why would you say your final expenses? And when they say final expenses, it's mainly because they don't want anybody to pay for it on the road. Right? Making sure that it does happen, no one's gonna come out of pocket for thirty or forty thousand right. dollars. Once you get them to kind of pick the one that they want and that's most important to them, use that for when you have to reduce them down. If you have to reduce them down in their in their coverage, you can use that to reduce certain things. Like if you know income protection is not important to them, don't pick income protection. Right? Make sure that when you go in and it has everything, B, maybe just take out income protection and C, make sure it's just final expense protection. Does that make sense? Like, if you're ever reducing them down, you just want to reduce down the things that aren't important. Keep the things that are important there in place. That's why they told you that they're important. Right? And then, um, you guys have any, any questions on child education or debt protection or anything like that? Just kind of getting them to realize that you know, if something happens, their kids are going to be off with, with some money as opposed to not having any money. Okay. Um, any, any questions, though? No? All right. All right. Okay. And then the last concern is not up here, which would be being able to qualify and affordability. Right. So the last no cost benefit they have set up for you is your means analysis. Right. Once you guys go right from this, you pop right to the needs analysis, right? You fill out the needs analysis, and then whatever the needs analysis recommends, show them right here. It makes you look, it makes you guys look smart. There's a reason why we do this before the needs analysis. Because this shows them what it would recommend, and then the needs analysis for your simulator confirms that. So they get a double understanding of what they what they need, right? But other than that, I mean, you guys have any other questions? That's faceless concerns. That's the only thing I really got to go over with you guys today. No? All right. No other questions? Okay, good, good. I love it. Quick. I told you. We're going to get, get it done nice and quick. Um, I'm going to put my number in the chat, guys. If you ever need anything and um, you need questions answered or anything about, let me know. Uh, and I can always reach back out to you here. Uh, just shoot me a text, let me know who it is, and I'll save your number and everything, all right? 812-841-9256. All right, guys, go have some fun today. You guys got some six coming up? No, no sits for me. I'm going to hop on the phone with um, uh, Stephen in a little bit. All right. Sounds good, man. Let's hop on the phone. Set some same day appointments and get some presets for the next couple of days. Sounds good. All right, Roy. I'll catch you soon, Thank man. You. Thanks for hanging out with us. All right, Paul. Appreciate it, man. No problem, man.